This episode of Unified is brought to you in part by Home Field Apparel. Are you bored with all the cookie cutter t-shirts for your favorite college sports team? Home Field Apparel, a premier brand out of Indianapolis, offers incredibly comfortable, officially licensed apparel with vintage college sports designs, so you won't look like everyone else wearing the same Nike t-shirt. Home Field combs through historic collections to find unique logos, mascots, and other graphics, and then uses those graphics to make thoughtful designs for schools as large as the University of Alabama and as small as a Division III school like Hope College. Check them out at homefieldapparel.com and get 15% off your first order with the checkout code UNIFIED. That's homefieldapparel.com and use the checkout code UNIFIED for 15% off. Hello and welcome to UNIFIED. I'm Paul Lucas of UniWatch, and with me as always is my co-host, Chris Creamer of SportsLogos.net. Hey, Chris. Hey. On this episode of Unified, we talk about collecting. Why are so many people who are into uniforms and logos also into collecting? What is the difference between collecting and hoarding? What did Paul and Chris collect when they were kids? And what do they still collect now? And what does all of this have to do with the 1987 movie, Throw Mama from the Train? We will answer all those questions, plus we'll have uniform headlines and our question of the week. But first, before we get to all of that, Mr. Chris Creamer, how are you? I am good, Mr. Paul Lucas. How are you? Are, are, have you uh, been uh, microchipped already with the, <laughs> how are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, I have a, a strange desire to buy Microsoft products after getting my, uh, <laughs> getting my first COVID injection. Um, and I see for those of us who, uh, or for those of our listeners who are, are watching on video, you can, they can see we're wearing green today because this is uh, St. Patrick's Day week. We're recording this on Tuesday, the day before St. Patrick's Day, but the episode will launch on Thursday, the day after St. Patrick's Day. But uh, green's always been my favorite color, so it's uh, always a good day to wear green. It's the day for Paul. Yeah. <laughs> so how's your week been? What's been going on? Oh, busy as always, right? Um, you know, uh, uh, one of the houses down the street from us sold for maybe double what they were looking for. So wow. oh. that gets that gets us thinking, right? <laughs> uh, so we, we had the real estate agent over the other day just to take a look at the house and give us an idea of what we would need to do to in order to put it on the market. I don't really want to sell my house, but with prices like that, you got to think about it. Mm-hmm. So we actually they, went. They, they get a skunk, the buyer would get a skunk at no extra charge. Uh, no, well, we're not going to put that on the listing. <laughs> <laughs> I actually went and toured a house the other day, uh, and while the asking price was well within our budget, the final sale price went for almost double that. So uh, it's fine if we can sell our house. If we have to buy another house, that's where we run into problems. But. Mm-hmm. It seems that uh, we're stuck with that, right? We have to buy another house. We, we, we can't just, we can't, you know, the police might come talk to me if I sell my house for my family and mm-hmm. don't invite them to a new place. But sure you'll come up with some sort of solution. That's right. We're, we're, we're looking at it, you know, but it's, it's very stressful just this little bit having the agent come around and point out all the faults with your home. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's not a fun experience, but, you know, hopefully, uh, Hopefully we make it work. It'd be nice to make a little bit of money on it. I'm not gonna lie, but and to upgrade, maybe find a, a place in a wooded area, let the kids run wild back there, no. tire themselves out. Paul, I see you are you have been magically transported for our, our audio listeners. Paul is now uh, broadcasting from a log cabin, it appears, but <laughs> a very nicely decorated log cabin. Uh, Paul, tell me about where you are today. Yes, I have a new podcast studio today. We're trying out a, a new uh, new setting for this episode of Unified. Uh, I'm basically in a different room of my apartment, and uh, I was driven to try that because uh, our listener and longtime UniWatch reader, Kevin Searfoss, uh, who goes by the nickname Gas House, made this amazing, for those who are, who are watching on YouTube can see this, uh, this amazing 3D wooden Unified logo. Uh, and it's it's our logo, the same one you see in the corner of the screen and on our website and, and our Twitter feed and all that stuff. And it's it's rendered in 
it's like 20 inches wide and rendered in, in wood and it's so it's just awesome and he did this out of the kindness of his heart just as a, as a gesture of support and I my understanding Chris a little birdie tells me is that uh, one of these same items is heading your way in the not too distant future so you make it that's that great in the awesome in the podcast studio we probably shouldn't talk too much about the visual aspects because our <laughs> audio listeners are going to get you know they're going to say we, we can't see this stuff why are you talking about these things we can't see we're enticing them to check it out <laughs> to check out the YouTube. <laughs> but paul like uh, this will add to my collection of uh, signs behind me Yes, because you right. see, I had felt bad because you had each week have been sort of curating and tailoring your backdrop uh, to match what we were talking about each mm -hmm. week. Uh, whereas I just had a plain white, white backdrop <laughs> behind me each week, and then I decided this week when when Kevin sent this uh, this great logo uh, rendering, I thought, all right, it's time I should really try to try a little harder to have something appropriate. And so I've got the, the Unified logo, I've got some bobbleheads, I've got uh, an actual Riddell helmet back here with the, the UniWatch logo on it. I've got, and, and these are our, uh, the Uni, uh, UniWatch headquarters lockers behind me. This is sort of our locker room and I've got UniWatch magnets on it. And uh, I should take my own advice and stop talking about the, the visual things <laughs> that our audio listeners can't see. But uh, yeah, new, we're, this is sort of a test drive, training wheels for, uh, for this new podcast studio set up for me. I like it. It looks good. It adds to the atmosphere that we mm -hmm. have going on here. Yeah. 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 Is that the big news of your week or did you have something uh, Well, the other big thing is that, uh, you know, everybody's been marking their pandemic anniversaries and uh, my version of that, and I'll try to make it sick, uh, I'll, try to, I'll try to make it quick because everybody is sick of hearing uh, about pandemic anniversaries. But last March 17th, uh, my girlfriend and I, after a hard day in the beginning of lockdown, went out to our porch and had cocktails on our front porch. And we're lucky to have a porch, which is unusual in New York City. And I took a photo from the back of the porch of her sort of sitting on the front stoop uh, and of the sidewalk and the house across the street. And it was just sort of documenting the moment. And then the next day, we went out and had cocktails again. And I took another photo. And I've kept doing that. All year long, we did it all through, you know, a rainy day, a snowy day, a really, really, really cold day. It doesn't matter the weather. We do it at the end of each work day. And it's a way to just sort of appreciate that we have each other and, and that uh, as messed up as things have been, that we, we still have a lot to be thankful for and, and to feel good about. And tonight, uh, again, we're recording this on Tuesday, uh, will be the 365th daily pandemic porch cocktail session, as we like to call it, and the 365th photo, which kind of fits with today's uh, episode theme of collecting. It's sort of a collection uh, of, uh, of photos, and it's sort of the same photo each day, except uh, you, know, you can see the seasons change, you can see people walking by, dogs going by, uh, you know, as I mentioned, it could be raining or snowing or whatever. And we'll put a link to that in the show notes. I, I've got all the photos up on Flickr uh, and it's, it's a fun photo set to scroll through to, just to see the seasons change. And, um, and, and so it feels a bit like a milestone that today is the, you know, a full year or tonight will be a full year. And then tomorrow will be the, the anniversary. I guess we should have an anniversary patch or something. <laughs> well, you could do a time-lapse of all those photos too. Put yeah. Yeah. I was thinking of maybe doing that. They're not, they're almost all from the same perspective there. You know, there's a few slight variations in there. So I'm not sure how effective the time-lapse would be, but maybe, yeah. maybe. Uh, so that's uh, that's my my big news, uh, if you want to call it that. And it does sort of feel like I don't want to say an accomplishment, but uh, I don't know. I feel like there's light at the end of the tunnel, finally, pandemic wise. And, that's hope. And Certainly so, seems that way. Yeah, and so getting getting to this point, and with spring coming, and with more and more people being vaccinated, it seems like yeah, we're getting there. I mark the anniversary by just saying, "Hey, it's the anniversary." To my mm -hmm. wife <laughs> well we didn't do anything because you know the kids running around we can't really unwind like that um but you know following your uh, your uh, porch cocktail uh patio cocktail uh, photos like i was just so jealous looking at those like man i wish i could do that that looks like such a a good relaxing time just sitting there watching the world go by and, and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you're in your own little space there and maybe if i buy a new house i'll get a, a patio on it, <laughs> or a porch on it <laughs> Uh, all right, enough about us. Let's, uh, yeah. let's move to the uniform news of the week uh, in the past week. 
Uh, probably the biggest news um, in terms of high profile uniform stuff is that the NBA finally came out with the earned uniforms, um, which many of which have been leaked um, and all of which will be worn a handful of times in this shortened season and then probably never seen again unless some of them are sort of recycled into, you know, if some are seen that are deemed to be particularly successful or popular, I suppose they could sort of become a statement, you know, mm-hmm. or something like that. Uh, what, what do you, what did you think of the earned uniforms and what do you think of that program in general? Uh, well, mostly terrible, right? Like <laughs> <laughs> that, that seemed to be the overwhelming response, at least what I heard on Twitter and, and my own feelings. There's a couple in there that looked nice. Like I, I thought Orlando had a pretty decent design. Uh, Orlando has a logo that really works for the center logo with like the arch mm-hmm. uh, and the ball. Um, you know, my Raptors, we got purple back. Uh, this isn't the way I wanted purple to come back. I like, was... <laughs> Oh boy! Just you don't again, like the purple chevron. It, it's it's a gigantic chevron that <laughs> goes from the middle of the chest down to the knees. Like it's maybe scale back on the chevron, right? We just we just introduced it this year. Let's uh, take a step back, guys. It's a little too much. Uh, but the fact that purple is now part of the Raptors color scheme again, I can confirm looking at the Raptors official style sheet that purple is an official Toronto Raptors color once again. For the first time since I think might be 2008, when it was still lingering in the the style sheet. So hey, it's it's a bit of a speaking of lights at the end of the tunnel, could be a light at the end of the Raptors purple tunnel right there. And Paul, I know you don't like purple, I know, but for the Raptors, it's it's a franchise. It's one color. Of their foundational colors, uh, yes. you know, from the founding of the team, the origin of the team, and so it's yeah, I I, I totally get the attachment to something like that. And your thoughts? Uh, I have a hard time taking the earned program seriously, especially yeah. when, you, when a team quote unquote earns uh, these uniforms by making the playoffs, which more than half the league gets to do uh, in this past season, uh, four of the 16 teams that made the playoffs did so with losing records. <laughs> uh, so we're setting a pretty low bar there. Um, and and they, it's just part of this churn, which we've talked about, you know, a couple of episodes, we've talked about how to fix the, the NBA or how to fix their uniforms. And I don't know if we specifically said get rid of the earned uniforms, but like, that would be a start that, uh, the, this program that it is, it just seems silly. Um, I, if somebody suggested a, a better thing would be for the 14 teams that did not make the mm-hmm. playoffs, that they should be stuck wearing the worst uniform <laughs> from their past as a throwback. And that could be the shamed edition right? <laughs> rather than the earned edition. Like, How much fun would that be though? I, I, I can't imagine teams would sign on sign up for that right they would have some objection to it yeah but it would be, it would be like being relegated in, in soccer right? yeah relegated to a lesser degree right i mean you're not getting <laughs> kicked out of the league or anything but uh how, how fun would that be though to see every team wearing their <laughs> their worst uniforms i like how the brooklyn yeah, I mean, nets I would, though I, would, I, would, I, I think that would be a lot more fun than a lot well, absolutely it would be but the, the nets did so voluntarily so kudos to them Right, the Nets are already wearing their tie-dye throwbacks, which a lot of people think should be would, would be their shame edition if they were to do that. But it, uh, I, I have to say, I, I do like a few of the earned designs. I actually like the 76ers one. A lot of people don't like it because it just has the Liberty Bell on the number and it doesn't say Philadelphia, it doesn't say 76ers, you know, it has no type, it has no lettering. But I, I love that. I think it's a great looking uniform. Uh, I was surprised by how much I liked the sort of warm yellow of the heat mm. design. Uh, I thought that worked pretty well. But overall, it, it, even if you can find a decent design or two in here, it seems to me the program itself is really misconceived. And, and like, uh, I'm, I'm hoping that, because the earned, the earned program has been on again, off again. They introduced it in 2018-19, then got rid of it for 2019-20 they brought it back this year and i hope they get rid of it again because it just doesn't i don't think it works yeah and especially this latest crop like it's just it, it you're you're really starting to stretch things thin here now yeah right? it feels it's like they're scraping the bottom of the barrel yeah the city and edition is, was was stretching and, enough but and this is the thing with the whole nba uniform program that between you know the the annual churn or turnover of the city designs the every two or three year turnover of the statement designs, now the earned design, 
it's unsustainable. Like, I don't see how it's sustainable. Like, you can't keep coming up with anything worthwhile at that pace. It, it just doesn't work. Sounds like you're issuing a challenge. <laughs> I'm issuing a, a plea, a, a, a please, just like, stop. It's not all right. Uh, so that was one thing that happened this past week. Another thing happened, I guess, right before we started recording, and I wasn't even aware of it. So you told me before uh, we joined on the air. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, I actually delayed the start of the program to finish <laughs> writing about it. And that was uh, that minor league baseball today has launched a, a tweak to their league logo. And it, it just continues on the off-season theme of minor league baseball. A lot of change in minor league baseball this off-season. This is just another example of that. Uh, part of their partnership with Major League Baseball and how they're practically being taken over by MLB at this point. Uh, the logo, uh, the minor league baseball logo was fairly similar to MLB's logo already. Like the previous colors, uh, it was in an oval shape. It had a batter in the middle. Uh, what they've done now is they are now duplicating Major League Baseball's colors, which are the colors of the U.S. flag. Uh, they have altered the shape of the logo to match MLB's logo exactly. So they're both that thin, rounded uh, rectangle. And uh, they adjusted the batter to fit in there more. Uh, and they've done away with the Minor League Baseball wordmark underneath the logo. Now it just says MILB, embracing the acronym, much like MLB did. I noticed also the bat itself, which it, it now sort of cleaves the logo in two, just like the, the MLB silhouetted batter does. That it sort of extends mm -hmm. off the off the plane of the of the logo. Um, it sort of bleeds off the edge, uh, and which is another sort of nod to the MLB logo. So you yeah. see this as sort of a like a homogenization, like it's it it's watering down the minor league identity to match the major league identity a little more. Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, I like the fact that minor league baseball seemed to be its own thing, mm -hmm. uh, even though it was affiliated. I like that some of the minor league teams would have completely different uh, branding from their affiliates uh, and that everything was a little chaotic in minor league baseball. Right. And that was that was part of the appeal for me. I, I liked right. that it was a little different. Um, now it feels, you know, who knows what they're going to end up naming these leagues, the AAA East, AAA West. Uh, hopefully they go with something a little better than that, but it does feel like maybe uh, corporate. Is that the, uh, it feels like everything's a little more corporate in minor league baseball. Like now the, uh, <laughs> now the high school band is, is being forced to wear, uh, ties and suits mm -hmm. instead of wearing like punk clothes or whatever. Um, did they say why they were doing it or what, you know, how it's new and improved or anything like that? Because I have not yet seen the press release. What, what, what is there? How are they sort of spinning this or, or promoting it? Uh, no press release. I did get a chance to interview their vice president of uh, business marketing. Uh, he told me that this was to sh uh, create a, a visual uh, showing of the coordination between the aligning, I believe is the word he used between Major League Baseball and Minor League Baseball. And just to show that, hey, we are pretty much the same thing now, just a lower level of uh, play. Um, but they did try to, to throw some things in there to make Minor League Baseball logo somewhat unique. They flipped the colors. If you notice, it goes red, white, blue instead of blue, white, red. Uh, they changed the font for the acronym. They're using a minor league baseball's font that they'd been using a couple of years, which I believe they call United. Could make a good name for a podcast. Um, and uh, yeah, so they're trying to do their own thing. They kept the four stars in there that major league baseball doesn't have stars that uh, represents the four different levels of minor league baseball. So they're trying to do their own thing. It, it does really seem like this is MLB sort of putting their foot down on minor league baseball and said, okay, fun's over guys. It's time to grow up <laughs> and, uh, you know, join the family business already. And then the, uh, the other thing, uh, in terms of, uh, uniform headlines uh, for this week, it, it, we are taking part of it, <laughs> taking part in it slightly, which is uh, teams wearing green yes. uh, St. Patrick's day. And, uh, again, we're recording on Tuesday, the day for St. Patrick's day, but some teams are already have already been wearing and, you know, cause not everybody plays literally on the, the day of the holiday. Uh, and so uh, tomorrow, I imagine in uh, spring training, lots of uh, lots of major league baseball teams will be wearing at least green caps, if not uh, 
uh, the green jerseys as well, and hockey teams, NHL teams will have the, the green warm-ups, um, and you've got your uh, Toronto uh, St. Pat's throwback hanging mm -hmm. behind you because the, the Maple Leafs will wear that. Have they worn it already? When are they wearing it? They wore that a couple days ago on the mm -hmm. 14th of March, mm -hmm. and they're going to wear it again on March the 19th because uh -huh. they don't uh -huh. actually play on St. Patrick's Day, so they wear it on the days around it. Right. Yeah. Uh, and I always think that's fun. And uh, green is my favorite color. So, you know, I'm, I'm a fan of, uh, of any, any team wearing green. Uh, and it especially seems good for um, spring training because, you know, the games don't count. And so if the teams look ridiculous, okay, it's, you know, it's all in good fun. It's a way to just uh, raise a little more interest in spring training. I do kind of miss when uh, the NBA had teams do it. Uh, you know, there was that period where, and the Raptors, the Raptors even did it. They uh, did, yeah, yeah. The Knicks, the Bulls, and the Raptors had green uniforms, and the Celtics had different green yeah. uniforms. They added they, the gold trim, which looked really sharp on them. It did. It, 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 it was sort of funny because it, it looked, in a way, more formal, whereas the other teams looked a little more jokey, you know, like the Bulls <laughs> wearing green or the Knicks wearing green. And uh, I always thought that was sort of a fun thing for the NBA to do, and uh, I, I'm surprised they pulled back from it. Um, Considering. <laughs> yeah, considering everything else they do. Uh, so, uh, yeah, St. Patrick, we, we considered, uh, for those who are wondering, we considered actually devoting this episode to the idea of St. Patrick's Day uniforms, but there isn't a whole lot to say except, yeah, teams teams are green. Green. <laughs> The only thing I, I wish teams would do, uh, like, is the idea of wearing green goes back a few decades now. Uh, what I miss about those days is that you had no idea who was wearing green. You had no idea what the design was going to be. And you didn't know until you saw the game or read the newspaper the next day. Uh, there didn't seem to be any sort of coordinated, uh, templated design like you do see in Major League Baseball in previous years. It's just like, okay, here's MLB's approved green design for you this year rather than... Um, uh, you know, uh, you turn on a game and you're surprised that a team's wearing green, which I, I loved. Yeah, there's no element of surprise. No, and the Mets did a great thing a few years ago, when at least I thought, where they took Mr. Mets' head and made yeah. it into a leprechaun for yeah. the St. Patrick's Day caps. Yeah. 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 Going outside of that league-wide template, at least having a little bit of fun with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you see it in the NHL too, right? All the teams wear a, a templated pre-game warm-up jersey. It's the right. exact same design for every team. Just swap out the logo. Uh, nothing could be less fun than that <laughs> in, in yeah. terms of the special and, jersey. And it's, I have to say, that's because of merchandising, right? It's because they, there's a standard design so they can crank it out for retail. And the whole idea of teams doing their own thing or, or doing, you know, not coordinating it, not talking to each other, not have, you know, it, it's because there's a single apparel manufacturer, a single uniform outfitter, uh, and there's one basic template. And and I, I understand why some people really like uniform merchandising, but it does curtail certain fun aspects mm -hmm. and it does lead to templating, which can be really boring. Uh, yes, extremely boring. And I just want, yeah. I just uh, remember just now, uh, I remembered uh, as a kid seeing the front page of the uh, Toronto Sun and it had a picture of Kelly Gruber, Blue Jays third baseman of the day, wearing a green cap at the spring training game. And I just got the reference because the headline said Kelly Green. <laughs> and I just got that now because of Kelly Green, the color. How many, how many years ago did you see this? I, I think that was 1991. So 30 years ago. 30 years ago. <laughs> well, I'm I like not that's sure clever. more interesting or, or surprising that you still remember that or that you, did you kick in until just now? I just, I don't The things I remember, Paul, um, <laughs> <laughs> the weird things that stick with me. All right. So that, uh, I think that takes care of uh, uniform headlines for the last week. And before we move to our main topic of the episode, uh, do you have an ad read to do? I do have an ad read and it's a good one and it's good news for everybody out there that follows us because this episode of Unified is brought to you in part by Ebbets Field Flannels. Can you believe it? Ebbets Field Flannels, the leader in vintage authentic sports apparel since 1988. Some of the designs that came out in 1988 could be produced by Ebbets Field Flannels now. That's 33 <laughs> years ago. To put that in perspective, the first pro sports throwback game didn't even happen until 1990, but our friends at Ebbets Field Flannels were already setting the pace for authentic retro sportswear. 
And when we and when we say our friends, we really mean it because we've worked with Jerry Cohen, Andy Hyman, and the other great people at Ebbets Field Flannels for years. Ebbets even makes Ebbets even makes Paul's official uni watch baseball caps. And hopefully one day sportslogos.net caps, because I really want one of those, even just for me. Uh, they're great people, and of course, they make and sell sensational products, including authentic vintage jerseys, caps, t-shirts, jackets, and more. Check them out at ebbets.com and get 10% off any merchandise except NFL items by using the checkout code UNIFIED. Again, ebbets.com, 10% off anything except NFL with checkout code UNIFIED. And with that, let's talk about collecting. Let's talk about collecting because when, uh, as we have built our friendship, one thing we've learned is that we are both collectors. And what I have noticed among my readers over the years, UniWatch readers, and I'm sure you've noticed the same thing about, uh, from sportslogo.net readers, is that so many people who are into uniforms and logos are also into collecting. Uh, sometimes they collect uniform and logo type things like jerseys and caps and sports memorabilia, but often they collect things that have nothing to do with any of that. Uh, they just seem to have the gene for collecting, so to speak. Why do you think that is? There's got to be some connection between a, a uniform fan and, and someone that appreciates uh, collecting. And I've been thinking about it, and I, I think the uniform fan appreciates the finer details and things. Mm -hmm. right like they really hone in on little details things that other people might not otherwise notice when it comes to collecting items to complete perhaps a set or to have a, a variety of a, a similar theme you're essentially doing that right you are appreciating the finer themes the, the finer things uh the small little details the little differences between each item like i look in your background and i see three different bobbleheads right you appreciate the small little differences between each of those bobbleheads mm -hmm. uh some people might be happy just having one <laughs> <laughs> but uh you like myself um i enjoy uh, seeing the little variances trying to perhaps complete a set and being a completionist uh and i mean that applies to other things that people like to collect think of people who collect bottle caps right and just look at the different designs a bottle cap is like a uniform essentially for a different different purpose a different product mm -hmm. uh, a stamp collector right you're collecting all the different designs appreciating all the different details in the design um, and i think that it's very similar to someone that enjoys the little details in a uniform memorabilia logos uh, there might be um, uh, that uh, the people who think uh, like we do they might be more uh, oriented in uh, in completing things too is like uh, me for my website. Um, I'm uneasy if I see a team that isn't uh, complete in their logo history, right? I look, oh, that's bothering me. I got to complete that little set, right? And that's that's a form of, I guess that's digital collecting for me. I'm just sharing my digital collection with everybody basically mm -hmm. is what my website is. Uh, so yeah, I think there's some crossover with that. I think collecting and uniforms are ways to sort of impose order and structure on the chaos of the world. Uh, uniforms, they're basically programmatic classification systems. They say, you know, these people wear this, this design, these people wear this design, this team wears this, this team wears that. Uh, and there are rules and protocols. You wear this uniform on, uh, at home, you wear this one on the road, you wear this one for Friday night games or whatever the case might be. Uh, and collecting can often be the same way. Well, this qualifies as the thing I could, eh, this one doesn't quite qualify. This is sort of related. It's adjacent to what I collect, but it's not specifically the thing that I collect. People have very specific rules and I'll get to some of the rules that, that I've had for some collections over the years in a minute. Uh, and I, I do think there is a satisfaction to having protocols and, and guidelines that uh, that some people at least relate to that, and that if you're in, it doesn't surprise me in that sense that if you are into uniforms and the rules and protocols governing them, as well as all the details and all the, the things you were talking about, I don't mean that this is instead of what you said, I mean, it's in addition to what you said. I think if, if you're into that aspect of uniforms, I think there is, there, it, it makes sense that you would also collect. 
because uh, a, you, like a team is a, is a collection of players, right? In a category, they all wear the same thing. Uh, and, and what are leagues, but you know, they're broken down into conferences and divisions, all of which are their own little collection. And so I, I feel like there's, it's, it's creating order and categorizing everything in its own little place, like a place for everything and everything in its place. There's, there's something satisfying about that sense of order rather than chaos that I think um, for me at least, and I think for, for many other uniform fans, like it, it's part of the same button being pushed in your head. Yeah. Uh, the, the uniform thing and the collecting. Thing. I think there's nothing worse than having a collection with that order and then it being unorganized, right? <laughs> like, in, like it's not alphabetical. It's not tallest to shortest, you know, it's... Right, right. There has to be like an organizing principle and then that principle has to be followed. That's right. And, <laughs> and if it goes out of order, my gosh, are you going to hear it? And, and you know, I, I get that from followers too. If I, I post a graphic and uh, I follow a certain rule for every team, and then one team goes slightly outside the rules, that's what every single comment is. <laughs> <laughs> you know, why did you do that? Why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do this? And it's usually, I just felt like using that one, you know, like <laughs> for that particular moment. Um, I preferred this over that. And uh, it wasn't any sort of bias, or any sort of slight. There's no conspiracy. <laughs> it was just in the moment, I thought that looked better. Uh, what did you collect as a kid growing up? Well, most kids of uh, the time I grew up, which was late 80s, early 90s, especially as a sports fan, uh, baseball, hockey, basketball, football cards, because uh, the trading card boom happened in the late 80s, early 90s. And uh, I was not spared that. Um, I still have uh, piles and piles of 30, 35 year old baseball cards that are worth nothing because every single person has piles and piles of these 30 year old baseball cards too. We were all told that, you know, these cards are going to be worth so much money when you grow up, you better collect them. And uh, that didn't happen because everybody they, else they didn't, didn't explain that they, they didn't explain the concept of scarcity to you. That, that's right. It's it's cheaper now. Like I go to a store and I will see a pack of, you know, 1990 hockey cards for a quarter, <laughs> right? Or a pack of 2021 hockey cards for five bucks. So uh, it, it was just a bad era for that. But I collected a lot of that. Uh, I've transferred that to, I've tried to transfer that to my my son. Um, he doesn't seem to appreciate, you know, putting the cards into sleeves, into pages and the order and the, <laughs> the order from the chaos that, uh, I, I need from that. So I, I don't push it on him too much. Um, I also collected like eighties wrestling figurines and uh, yeah, uh, wrestling was big in my house, WWF. Um, and, uh, you know, one of, one of our friends, uh, Frazier Davidson, who's a designer, he, he does a series of animated wrestling figurines. So if he's listening, I see that and I love that, by the way. Um, that's what I collected as a kid, mostly. Uh, I was limited to what my parents would buy for me. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, aside from things you pick up on the road, like picking up a, a leaf and doing a rubbing or uh, stickers. I think I collected stickers back then as well. Mm -hmm. um, and the problem then was, well, there's nothing here worthy of me peeling off the backing of the sticking and of the sticker and sticking it to like i i need to save this sticker for something that's worth being stuck to because it's going to be there forever and ultimately i would never stick it on anything <laughs> uh, i uh, i also collected baseball cards not football cards at least uh, i grew up uh, i'm a bit older than you so i grew up in the 70s football cards were very unsatisfying because tops didn't have a license with the nfl then so they had to airbrush out all the helmet logos um, you know? <laughs> and so it was just not it, you know, you get your favorite player or what you know, your players on your favorite team, but they wouldn't have the helmet look. It would just be a blank helmet. And it, it just, uh, I can still remember being in like fourth grade and like opening the pack and just thinking like, what is this? Like, this is not, <laughs> it didn't seem official. You know, it, it, it felt very like unofficial. And uh, so- But they did uh, the old poses, right? Like the, I'm, I'm posing like- <laughs> Yeah, like a Heisman Trophy kind of photo and that kind of thing. Yeah. So they, they, uh, so football cards, I sort of dabbled with, but didn't get into, but baseball, I was very into baseball cards, which I did collect um, pretty seriously from like second grade through sixth grade. 
then I got more into comic books, like basically all your suburban male things to collect. So uh, baseball cards, comic books, pennies, because they're the cheapest coin, obviously, to collect. So I had a, I had a big penny collection. And, and then there, I went through this period of sort of like putting aside childish things, you know, and I, I decided I should stop wasting my time with the, these collections. But I, I stopped those collections, but I later came back around and wanted to collect other things. And as I got older, I found, especially as a young adult, I was really searching for something to collect in a way that would define me. I, I didn't think of it that explicitly at the time, but looking back, I, I realized I wanted, like I wanted to think like, yeah, that's who I am. I'm a guy, I'm the kind of guy who collects this, whatever this, you know, or I'm, I, I want people to think of me as the kind of person, when they see that I collect this, they're gonna think of me a certain way. And I, I was not aware of it sort of that explicitly, but I was clearly thinking of collecting as some kind of identity or searching for an identity, uh, none of which really worked because that's not a good reason to collect anything. Uh, but eventually I did just find things I was passionate about. I, I went through a period where I collected coin operated objects. So I had like a payphone, a uh, Coke machine, a parking meter, um, all these things got sold the last time I moved. Um, I collected, I, re I really liked the cultural intersection of bowling and beer. So I had, dozens of uh, torn out from magazine beer ads that showed people bowling, like an old Budweiser ad that showed people bowling, an old Miller High Life ad that showed people bowling. And I had those all over the house. Um, that was a very specific kind of collection. And, and they were, that was what I was talking about. Like, like there were rules for that. Like what if the, what if people weren't actually bowling in the ad? They, they were just standing around like holding a bowling ball. Does that count? Like, or, or do they have to actively be bowling, you know? There are all, all sorts of rules and guidelines. Um, I still collect um, sales and sample catalogs. I really like cat catalogs are another way to create order out of chaos. Mm -hmm. They categorize things in, in different sections. They have very specific item numbering systems, you know, for each, each item in the catalog. And I like catalogs that have an actual swatch or sample of the, the item. And then a subset of my catalog collection is, of course, a uniform catalog collection. So I have all these uh, vintage uniform catalogs from the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. And those are pretty great. And they're a great resource, of course, uh, for UniWatch. Um, what about you? What do you collect now uh, as, as an adult? Uh, I'm going to quickly share the story of, of Todd and I at the uh, pub in New York. Do you remember this story? Yeah. Are you okay with me sharing it? I, I'm sorry. I don't, I don't know where you're going with this. Story. Oh, okay. Uh, I think it was the first time the three of us ever got together. Uh -huh. So you're talking about Todd Radom. Yeah, Todd Radom, the designer Todd Radom, and, and I were sitting at a pub in, uh, I think it was the Upper West Side. I don't really know. <laughs> and uh, Paul came in with, uh, you had a backpack. Uh -huh. or, uh, and you put it on the table and you're like, look what I got, guys. And it was a was it, aluminum siding salesman catalog. Oh, yeah. I had just gotten that catalog. Just yeah. Gotten yeah. It. It was, oh, it was amazing. That catalog. It was, it was, was but it, 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 I think what Todd and I said was, this is the most Paul Lucas thing we've ever seen. And we meant <laughs> that in a nice way. <laughs> but it, it was awesome going through it. You're right. And they had like actual physical samples you could touch. And like you said, it created a little bit of order. But it was from the 50s or 60s, so you had all them, 50s, I think, yeah. all the wonderful vintage 1960s graphics all the way through. Yeah, it was beautiful. It was a beautiful piece of design. Yeah, it was all laid. Um, it was big too. It was really large. Mm -hmm. I almost felt like buying some uh, aluminum siding. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that's what the realtor said about uh, how you can improve the value of your house. That's right. <laughs> Here, let me show you some samples. Uh, what do I collect now? I, I you know. So much. Uh, obviously, I collect all the sports merchandise. Uh, people knowing me would know that. Uh, watching the video, you'll see every week I have a different jersey up, a different pennant up, uh, different knickknacks uh, on the speaker behind me. Uh, and really, this is the only place this stuff gets used now because, <laughs> because I'm damn near 40 and I really don't have a use for it anymore, but I could never separate it <laughs> from me. Um, but beyond the typical sports things uh, that I think all of our listeners probably collect, uh, I've clicked some odd things too. Uh, and uh, one of them I just started collecting because 
uh, my parents, when they moved out, they, they moved out of, on me <laughs> and I stayed in my childhood home. So uh, they left everything. And one of the things I found was an old uh, a drinking glass from 1967. And I'm going to show it on, uh, on YouTube here. And it's a Canadian centennial glass that celebrates all the prime ministers of Canada. And I just, it's just a, you know, <laughs> it's got little headshots of everybody there. And I just, I just loved it. And I started drinking from it all the time until I realized, well, I'm going to damage it if I keep putting it in the dishwasher. But then I'd go to secondhand stores and I would find other glasses that had similar uh, styles, similar designs, especially anything focused on uh, Canada in the 60s and the 70s, uh, a lot of Canada centennial stuff from 1967. Uh, and every time I found one, I would just pick it up and I would buy it. And here's another Canada centennial glass I'm showing in a beautiful teal color with all the coat of arms of all the provinces and the Canada centennial uh, logo, which I love. Um, people who watch on YouTube will notice that I occasionally drink from a Canada centennial uh, beer stein. <laughs> so something about that design period. So I try to focus on like random, obscure Canadiana uh, drinking glasses. Canadiana, yeah, I like that. That's I don't even know if that's a word, but I'm using it. There's a Montreal 1976 Summer Olympic glass that I have. And what I would, what this did though, was it, it created some rules for me because I would go into these secondhand stores and I would want to buy a million things because I just love the vintage stuff. So this was a way of limiting me. I would say, okay, I'm only allowed to buy one vintage glass, as long as it's got some sort of random Canadian uh, retro theme to it. Um, you know, don't go buy like 20 jerseys, you have enough, but these glasses are great. They're small, they can fit in the cabinet, they look cool. And that sort of filled my little need to collect something. I, I feel like you've hit upon one of the the pitfalls of collecting, which is the sense that you're never done. Mm -hmm. You can never collect everything unless it's like a limited number. You know, some, I guess with baseball cards, you know, there's a, you know, how many cards are in the set and you can collect the whole set. But if it's, if it's some vintage category, often it, it seems never ending and you never get to the bottom. And, and, and there's this fear that like you're missing out on the best one and it's working out there somewhere. And how will you ever find it? Uh, once, uh, a few years ago, I was collecting um, vintage pencil sharpeners, which was sort of a rabbit hole I went down. That's a whole story in itself. But I discovered that there are all these uh, different designs. And I'm talking about the hand-cranked ones like you'd have in, in grade school. And they'd mount on the wall. And I realized there was an archway in, in my apartment at the time. And I could put them up one side of the arch and over on the ceiling and down the other side of the arch. And then when I got enough of them to fill that space, I was done. And that was sort of a relief. It was kind of liberating to know that I didn't need to get every beautiful vintage pencil sharpener in existence. I just needed enough to fill that space. And so it was sort of a self-limited collection. And that was, that was kind of nice. It was, it was an experience I hadn't had before. Because usually it, it's like, oh, there's always another one. There's always going to be another Oh, like, hey, you think, you're, oh, there's another one. It, and, it's almost healthier to do it this way because yeah. <laughs> it, it gives you a goal. This. Now, but the problem is if you find a, a beautiful pencil sharpener that you just have to have, then you have to create that rule that, well, if I want to buy this one, I have to get rid of one of these ones. You know, actually, it, it, no, I don't have that. This is another collection that I sold the last time I moved. And I was really happy to when, when one guy came over and bought all the pencil sharpeners in one shot. I thought I was going to sell them piecemeal, you know. And one guy bought the whole collection, so I was kind of happy that the collection stayed intact. But before that, before I moved, I, it was surprisingly easy to let go, to say, you know what, I'm done. I, I filled the archway. Uh, I didn't find myself like just sort of randomly peeking at eBay. You know, <laughs> it wasn't that kind of thing. Like, just let me see, you know, pencil sharpener. Let me type that in to the search field. But I. I I was done. I filled the archway. It was, and it was, it was a different collecting experience for me. Now you have, you have one particular collection that I think is a genius collection that well, I, I hope you will share with us. Here. I'll, I'll share it with you. Um, 
I'm going to share one last one quickly before I get to this one because oh, okay. I, didn't, I didn't mean I didn't mean to push you or rush you. No, it's fine. I didn't know how to. I don't know how to segue this naturally, so I'm just going to do it uh, as unnaturally as possible. Um, before I get to the weird one at the end, because uh, there's no going back from that, uh, <laughs> because I pulled this off the wall, so I need to show it. Um, another thing I did was I collected uh, too many things when I went on trips, so. I'm showing this now. These are magnets from every trip I go on. <laughs> and the rule that I make is that it has to be a non-templated and the appearance of a handcrafted design. <laughs> so almost like ceramic. So I'm sure there's trips from Europe. There's the world's largest dinosaur in Drumheller, Alberta, uh, Hockey Hall of Fame, Baseball Hall of Fame. There's Rome, Pisa over there. So these uh, are all magnets. And what are they? what are they attached to what are they magnetized on this like, is, they got a sheet of metal just for displaying them yes i bought this at ikea <laughs> it's a big metal sheet i have three of these full of magnets and uh we took them off the wall because we might be selling as i mentioned earlier <laughs> <laughs> and uh i don't want people swiping my valuable magnet collection oh well, it is valuable to you i mean that's the thing right it's personally valuable so i wanted to quickly show that one because like i said i uh i carted it all the way over here and it's quite heavy the one Paul's referring to is, and I have no justification for this, and I swear I'm not crazy. Collecting does not require a justification. You know those tabs you get when you buy a loaf of bread? Yeah, bread tags. Some people call them bread tags. I think the official term in the industry is quick locks. K-W-I-K-L-O-K-S. Quick locks. That's the name of the company, the, the main company that makes them. And I love that you know that, Paul. It's just one of the many reasons why I love talking to you. <laughs> I've, uh, I've, I've done a story on them. So. Uh, they're all they're also uh, known in Ontario, Canada, as uh, milk bag tabs because we sell our milk in bags in Ontario, and mm -hmm. they come with the same tab as you see on bread elsewhere in the world. So here I'm holding up to the camera. I don't know how many I have in there, but probably about two, three hundred. So that's a jar of jar. Of tags. And is that, the, is that the one jar you have, or do you have several jars? This is the only jar I have of this, but I mean, it's enough. <laughs> Consider the size <laughs> of them. Uh, so I don't and entirely how, remember. How and why did you start? I'm sorry. To yeah, I, I'm not entirely. I, I remember uh, <laughs> I saw my, my father-in-law had a small little drawer with maybe about five or six of these things. And I, I mocked him for it. I said, why are you saving those? That makes no sense. Um, and then I went home and immediately started collecting them. And <laughs> I think my goal is or was to get one with every date of the year on it. Well, that's what's interesting about them, right? Aside from the colors, because they do have like this very colorful cool. confetti look to them, but they each have a date for the, the expiration date of, of that loaf of bread or, or the, that bag of milk or whatever the case might be. And so I never would have thought of this, but a total genius move on your part. You were looking to basically fill the calendar, right? Like to have one for every day of the year. That's right. And uh, it got really exciting last year when February 29th came around. Cause that's, right. that's my, that's the Holy grail. <laughs> <laughs> so did you go to the supermarket with a specific aim of, of getting a, a February 29th bread tag? I did, and it was just, oh, just before the pandemic, right? Because it, it's like February 20th or 21st, I started looking through the, the bread and the milk, and uh, I found a loaf of raisin bread, which I don't like. <laughs> and it, that was the only one I found that had a February 29th tag, and I bought the loaf of raisin bread just to get that tag. And... Uh, my kids were, you know, they learned to love raisin bread that week. <laughs> but, you have them, the, the bread tags in the jar. Have yeah. you considered arranging them like chronologically or like pasting them onto a calendar or something like that? Yeah. Uh, at one point when I was extraordinarily bored during the, the pandemic, I took them all out and I organized them and I had a little sheet where I tallied what I had, which days I had duplicates of, some <laughs> days I had four or five of. Um but I haven't done that in a while, uh, but that is the ultimate goal. I I'd like to have them all laid out month by month. What I do after that, who knows? <laughs> yeah, I, love, I think that is a brilliant collection because it takes something from everyday life 
and it, it again it finds order in the chaos and i, and I just, it, that's genius i love and that. it doesn't cost any money it's something i would have thrown out anyways well, well, it does say it cost you the price of a loaf of raisin bread. You wouldn't have but, <laughs> but that was to get the super rare once every four <laughs> years. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I love that. I think that's such a great collection. Thank you. Uh, maybe, maybe one day I'll, um, I thought about doing this where I do a YouTube video just with a camera from above and I dump it out and it's just a video of me organizing them. No commentary, <laughs> I, I a I nice soothing that. video. <laughs> yeah, relax, OCD relax as I organize this chaos. <laughs> One thing that sort of hovers over collecting, I feel like, is the line between collecting and hoarding. What, what do you think is the, the difference between collecting and hoarding? And have you ever come close to that line or even crossed it? Oh, yeah. And that's something I'm trying to avoid. Uh, as I get older, I find I'm saying, I don't need that. I don't need that. Uh, just because space. And as I mentioned, uh, my parents uh, moved out and left me in the family home, not in a bad way, just the way it happened. And uh, when I moved with my wife to our current home, I pretty much had to take all my parents' stuff with us, which left us with a basement full of stuff. Um, so it kind of has the appearance of hoarding, uh, but we're trying to put some order into that. Uh, there is a difference between collecting and hoarding and um, John Hodgman, the actor, the comedian, I think has, has a great quote. Uh, he told uh, one of my writers, Paul Caputo, this for a story he did on a, on a separate site, uh, saying that the difference between collecting and hoarding is a display case. <laughs> <laughs> and he's right. If you have some sort of shelf or something to display and sort of nicely show off, all this stuff you've amassed, you are now a collector. Otherwise, you are a hoarder. <laughs> I, my definition or, or my just the way I draw the distinction between collecting and hoarder is similar to that. I think a collector wants to share his collection with other people. He wants them to see it. There's a sort of show and tell aspect to it. And I had totally forgotten about that time I met you and Todd at the bar and brought the cattle, but that was a great example of it. I, I was excited about this thing and I wanted to play show and tell. I wanted to say, hey guys, look at this, look at this thing I got. And to me, that's the mark of a collector that he wants other people to, to share and see and experience. Whereas the hoarder wants to kind of like swirl it all away. I think there's, at least as I understand it, like, it the degree to which hoarding is sort of a can be a disorder there's a big sense of shame about it and secrecy uh and it's something you don't want other people to see and that it's just your own insular isolated thing uh but collecting it, it you know yeah you want to put it in the display case and then like what's the point of the case it's not just for you to see it but for other people to see it and you can proudly say like there's my collection and or to, to me anyway that's how i see it and I, I'm always excited for people to come over and see my stuff. Oh, yeah. You've, you've given me tours of your place, both your, your last house and your current place. Uh, and it's like a museum walking through. There's there's something interesting everywhere you look. Uh, I remember your, your last place, you had a bowling pin set up in an old fireplace mantle uh, mm -hmm. where the fire would normally go. Yeah. Uh, hopefully you don't yeah, use those as, as your well, kindred. Chris, Chris, I have worked at home like from long before the pandemic. So yeah. I, I, I have always, like my rule has been that I, I want my home to be someplace where if I'm stuck here all day working, I want so that no matter where I look, I want there to be something that makes me smile. And so uh, that's that's usually the, the standard I'm shooting for. So. Uh, another thing I noticed about your house, and I hope you don't mind me giving away details of your house, <laughs> okay. um, but I found it so interesting, uh, like going into your kitchen, and all the appliances were, I don't know if they were working or not, but the appliances you had like set up on your counter all like vintage appliances, like your waffle iron looked like it was from the 1950s. I, I doubt it was, but it's, not, it's probably like from the eighties. It's just dirty, <laughs> <laughs> but it was like cast iron or something. Like it was, it looked like it was built to last. Uh, I like old stuff. Um, yeah, and what I mean, waffle irons—they will last. Like it's just a heating element in a fridge. Like every you, know, you buy one, you have it the rest of your life. Like you know, I'll tell you, we've gone through four or five. We're buying the wrong ones. Yeah, well, maybe it's one of those things where they they don't make them like they used to. Or something there you like go. That. Okay. Um, 
So this idea of wanting to share the collection uh, comes up in, in this 1987 movie, Throw Mama from the Train, uh, which I do not think is a very good movie, but it, uh, it does have this scene that's really interesting. And for those who haven't seen the film, it stars Danny DeVito and Billy Crystal. And it's got this convoluted plot that isn't worth getting into, but there's this one scene where Danny DeVito wants to show his coin collection to Billy Crystal. And it, and it is that sense of wanting to share it. And, and Billy Crystal initially isn't interested and Danny DeVito says, but, but it's my collection. And Billy Crystal sort of reluctantly agrees. And, and so let's, uh, let's look at that scene or for on audio, we can hear the scene where Danny DeVito is showing and describing his coin collection. There's a nickel. This one also is a nickel. And here's a quarter. And another quarter. And a penny. Think nickel, nickel, quarter, quarter, penny. The, uh, in the scene, of course, the, the coins are just coins. And Billy Crystal says, like, that's, that's just a handful of change. And almost in a mocking way, dismissive way. He is he's very dismissive. Yeah. He's very condescending toward Danny DeVito throughout the movie. And then Danny DeVito says, well, that's where you're wrong. See this, this nickel, this was the change from a hot dog that my father bought me at the first time he took me to a ball game. And this quarter, this is the change from one time when he brought me to the movies and he always let me keep the change. And, and what you realize is that each coin is a story and a memory and that what looks like just some loose change and what would be loose change to some people is a collection of memories for Danny DeVito's character. And I love that. I, I just love this idea that anything can be a collection and that often what we are collecting are memories and stories. And I, I don't know about you, but I remember how I acquired a lot of the things uh, that, that are my most precious collections. And it's, it's I'm not going to say it's a shame that eBay has made it easier because I do enjoy the acts. You know, eBay is like a giant museum, even if you don't buy things. It's just really interesting to see things there. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've, I've learned a lot about uniforms looking at yeah. eBay. There's so much interesting stuff there and, and so many uniform catalogs I've gotten on eBay that have been really instructive for my work. Uh, but when you, when you see a scene like that with, uh, with Danny DeVito talking about how we're collecting memories, I've, I've never understood that the people who buy like an entire Topps baseball card set in one shot, like the whole, like give me the whole 2004 set, you know, all 600 cards or whatever it is. Like to me, that's not collecting. That's, I don't know, it's just purchasing or accumulating or something. Like there's no... I don't know. I don't. I, I mean, I, I don't want to disparage anybody who's listening. If that's how you collect, that's you know whatever works for you, uh, and what works for me may not work for you, and vice versa. But uh, I love the idea that was shown in that scene that 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 anything can be a collection because what we're really collecting is stories and memories. Absolutely. And uh, Billy Crystal touches on that in the scene where he says, "Are are these coins worth anything?" And, and of course, they're worth, they're worth something to Danny DeVito. And, yes, I, and they're worth more to him than they could ever be worth to anybody ever, right? Like they're literally worth 25 cents to anybody else. But right. to Danny DeVito, they're worth uh, saving for the rest of his life. And it's preserving that memory. Every time he looks at it, he remembers his dad and he remembers going to the movies. And um, that, you know, that coin is a good way to trigger that memory. And you're almost like buying a memory for 25 cents. I still have old ticket stubs. I, see, I don't know if I, I would call this personally, if I would call this a collection, but I still have all the, the ticket stubs from ball games I went to basically from when I was seven through probably through high school, maybe through college. And those are definitely memories. They, and they sort of accumulated. It might be more of an accumulation <laughs> than a collection, uh, but I would never give them up. Uh, you know, I would, like they're they're absolutely precious to me. Each one is totally a memory. Like, oh, this was the time I took my father to the ball game on Father's Day, thinking I was doing him a favor when, in fact, you know, he had to drive through Father's Day traffic and stuff. <laughs> and this is the first game I ever went to, and this is when I saw Willie Mays hit a home run, and blah blah blah. Uh, and those sorts of collections, those seem like the most meaningful ones, right? Like the the ones that have memories attached to them, and um, and I think that's part of why people are into uniforms too. There is that sense of 
what connects us to teams and the memories and the the, the uh, emotional feeling that we have for teams uh, and why we respond so strongly to those logos, those uniforms, those team colors, no matter no matter which player is wearing them. You know. Uh, yeah, it's when you there's sometimes you watch a throwback game. At least I do. Uh, when the team is when they've picked the right throwback uniform, if you know what I mean. And um, I, I got to go back to my own hometown teams. We do it a lot, but that's what I grew up with. There was a game in 2009 where the Blue Jays were, when they were wearing their black and their white uniforms, and they were honoring their uh, World Series championship from 92, 93. And they took the field wearing, for the first time, the throwback uniforms from the World Series years. I think it's been the only time they've ever actually worn the 92 93 throwback uniform the button up the logo mm -hmm. off to the side and i didn't even think about it i just thought oh yeah, there's the blue jays right like because yeah. that's what they're supposed to look like to me right uh and, and a similar game watching the raptors when they threw back to the purple expansion season uniforms i hated that uniform when it came out and I hate that uniform today. But when I watched the game, I was like, oh, yeah, there's the Raptors. That's the Raptors. That's, and when you don't even think about it as a throwback uniform, that's when you know that's the right throwback uniform, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? And it, it's bringing back those memories and bringing back those feelings of when you fell in love with the team, when you fell in love with the game and formed those bonds. And, uh, yeah, that's all I got to say about that, Paul. <laughs> Russians can definitely do that. If, if yeah. You remember how you acquire things and, and yes. when you did and uh, can definitely uh, trigger those memories and collect but those memories. There, there's a, a lot of times my, my wife will ask how the, and you asked me this earlier, how the heck do you remember that? <laughs> and uh, I think nine times out of 10, I'm not necessarily actually remembering the moment, but I'm remembering, remembering the moment and uh by constantly having all this old stuff in my house left over from after my parents moved uh, i am going through it trying to you know uh, slim down on the stuff that we have in the house but as i'm going through uh a, a memory that i completely forgot about i open up oh wow i remember making this i remember drawing this picture i remember when i got and just seeing that brings back the memory and uh perhaps creates the illusion that I remember every single moment of my life. I'm just remembering the seeing this item brings back the memory of that and having so much of it constantly floods your mind with all those memories and causes you to remember things. Uh, I do have a hard time letting go a lot of those things, but I know I have to, uh, there's no possible reason for me to still have a, a TV guide from 1993. Right. <laughs> but, I can't throw this out. Look, it says a new episode of Seinfeld this week, right? Like that's <laughs> never going to be true again. But no, you can't keep this. Are you ridiculous? You can't. So what I found with with cell phones and unlimited storage and all that stuff, what I do is I take a picture of the cover and then I throw it in the garbage. <laughs> and, a digital collection, a documentation. Right. And what I, I never go back and look at those pictures, but taking the picture goes, <sighs> okay, you have it. You can mm -hmm. let go. Mm -hmm. And, throw, and it just sort of helps with the the hard process of what feels like you're throwing out a memory or but a piece of yourself almost yeah it is as ridiculous as it is and you know watching other people go through it and go why are you saving this and i don't know <laughs> but i can't get rid of it but uh i'm getting better as 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 time goes on it, and it feels better once you get rid of it to be honest yeah yeah it's us it's it's healthy, a healthy thing to do it is it's just hard to get through but once you get through it you feel fine. All right. This has been a really good discussion. I, I've enjoyed this. Yeah. And I hope uh, you guys tuning in this week uh, mind, don't mind that we steered away from uh, sports uniforms and logos a little bit, but uh, we feel this was related. It was, and yeah, it was uni adjacent. So let me close out uh, this section by saying uh, I briefly, as a kid, collected pennants. I had like a handful of, of Major League Baseball pennants. Um, and then I realized I didn't care about most of those other teams except the Mets. <laughs> so I was like, no, I'm not going to collect pens. But if I want to collect pens today, I would collect pens made by Oxford Pennant. Uh, and today's episode of Unified is brought to you in part by Oxford Pennant, designer and manufacturer of high quality pens, flags, and banners. 
You know how so many sports pennants are stiff and unpleasant to the touch? Oxford pennants products are genuine wool felt, just like old school vintage pennants, so they're super soft. One touch, and you, you can tell that this is a quality product. And I should know, people, I've been using Oxford to produce my UniWatch pennants for years now. Oxford Pennant has a full catalog of retail product promoting popular hometowns and clever sayings, but their real specialty is producing custom pieces for weddings, parties, and other special events. Whether their client is a couple celebrating an anniversary or the NFL's Buffalo Bills, all Oxford product is designed and manufactured at the company's downtown studio in Buffalo, New York. I've known Oxford Pennant uh, for years. Uh, they're really good people, the people who run it. They're really just thoughtful, kind, excellent people. And I can honestly say that they make the softest, nicest pennant I've ever encountered. Check them out at OxfordPennant.com and get 20% off your order, including if you want to order the UniWatch pennant, which is available on their website, with the checkout code UNIFY. That's OxfordPennant.com and use the checkout code UNIFY for 20% off. Paul, you are the king of the segue into the ad read. That was fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking like, oh, I used to collect pennants. It's like, I didn't plan it. It just sort of occurred to me while we were talking. Uh, now it, it is, uh, I believe it is time for our question of the week. Is that right? That is correct. Did we decide who is reading it this week? Oh, I think you're gonna, you can keep reading it. You are, you are the king of the question of the week. Another, another feather in my cap. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this week's question of the week comes from Twitter user at Saxbrack. Uh, Paul, Chris, what are your thoughts on the sports card industry cutting up and using game-worn memorabilia for cards? Um, I think a, it's uh, a very collectibles-oriented. Yeah, it, it's it's, it's, it's as if he the, did. Did he know? Thing. Did he know the theme before we started recording this? <laughs> I think we knew the theme when we picked the question. Oh well, okay. Don't give away the secrets, Paul. <laughs> um, that's a good question. And I can tell you one time, well, I'm going to start off by saying with so many game worn uniforms out there now, like, you know, some players change uniforms every period of a game now. It's, right. Or every inning or, or whatever. It yeah. Is. I mean, it's at, now it's, it's almost like we're not losing anything worth keeping. However, I can tell you about a time, maybe about 15 years ago where uh, there was a set of game-worn Georges Vesna 1920s goalie pads. And mm -hmm. I don't know if these were the only ones in existence or not, but George Vesna is a very important uh, player in hockey history. The league's best goaltender trophy is named after him. He played for the Canadians in the 1920s and 30s, and I believe he, he died during his playing days. Uh, he, I think he caught a disease and died in the late 20s, early 30s, when he was only in his 30s um and a, a pair of his game worn pads was purchased by a trading card company and they cut it up and they put little pieces of it in a trading card and when i saw that my heart broke <laughs> how can you do that to the, such a, a an old piece of memorabilia that clearly belongs in a hall of fame or a museum um well that's the thing right like why yeah. was that even available to be cut like, like right. why wasn't it in a museum already purchased from a private collector i'm sure and mm -hmm. i i agree that there's sort of some things seem sort of sacred uh and shouldn't be touched but then you know there's so many you know sometimes a game used jersey is from spring training or it's like a guy who like i said they change jerseys every inning or, or every period or whatever specifically for this reason Mm -hmm. so that they can autograph all of them and uh and and we know the whole game used uh industry you know there's a lot of fraud there as uh equipment managers have lost their jobs for floating game use supposedly game used stuff that wasn't game used and all this business i don't know uh, as somebody who doesn't like i don't i don't i love the mets but i don't want to wear a mets jersey it's just not my thing um but I do think it's sort of interesting to have a piece of a Mets jersey, whether it's in a, and it's not just the trading card industry. There's companies that will put a uh, jersey fabric in the lining of a wallet, mm -hmm. or um, they'll take base uh, tokens and icons, a company that uh, I believe is going to be advertising on this podcast uh, mm -hmm. soon. Um, they'll take a baseball, a game used baseball, 
and unwrap it, like take the hide off it and use the yarn inside the ball mm -hmm. to knit a hat, which is kind of clever. Like I, I like that idea that you can repurpose things. Um, so I'm not 100% opposed to it, but I agree there are certain things that that shouldn't be, you know, if it's a Hall of Fame player or, or whatever. That, that, but the idea that every single piece of every uniform is, is somehow untouchable just because it was worn for five minutes in a game, I, I wouldn't go that far. And I think it's fine to, to find creative uses and to make game use stuff uh, available to people who would not otherwise be able to afford it. Yeah, I, I, I think I, you and I are in agreement here that uh, you don't, you know, destroy something that's sacred, you know, that's super old. Uh, but now there's so much out there that really, who cares? And to be honest, like, I've gotten these game worn jersey cards opening a pack, and I'm like, ooh, I got, and then, okay. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> and it goes in my drawer like the rest of them. Huh. So it's it, like, it, unless it's the full jersey for me, mm -hmm it's not worth having, but I, I don't care if you destroy a Jersey that was worn for five minutes by, you know, who know. And, and some of these cards now, uh, you look, look at the fine print on the back and it'll say, uh, this is a game worn Jersey, not necessarily worn by this player. <laughs> but, okay. Fantastic. You now pulled it out of a laundry bin. <laughs> what if somebody wanted a piece of the the St. Pat's jersey, the <laughs> the the Maple Leafs throwback that's hanging behind you because it's sort of a a, a game quote unquote game worn or, or game shown uh, unified podcast jersey. You know, right. it's, it's been shown on our podcast. Uh, that would uh, require me breaking up my collection, Paul, and that's very hard for me to do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I I have never sold uh, any of my jerseys, not a single one, and. I probably should start because if I turn the camera a little bit to the left, you would see a big pile of them just sitting there. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think it would be hard to to part with it. But um, even though I, I don't think I even paid for this one, to be honest. Right. But uh, I'm just yeah. saying that people, it, it's interesting what people are are interested in. Like some like a real yeah. fan of our show might oh, say, yeah. oh, that's like, oh, that, that, that jersey has more value now because it appeared right. on the podcast on a YouTube version of the podcast. And now like, you know, they, they want a piece of that, that they're sure. they, they um, more quote unquote official. Let me, let me amend my answer. If someone wants to pay far above the actual price of this Jersey, <laughs> I would be willing to part for part with it. You know, I, I was throwing out show notes the other day from an old episode. I thought oh, maybe I should be saving these. these maybe this will be historic. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but then now I'll have a collection of unified show notes lying around. Paul, <laughs> uh, well, good episode. Good episode. Okay. I think we have uh, once again found ourselves uh, at the end of an a, a interesting conversation on a good episode of Unified. You want to take us out? I will take us out. Chris is reading the credits this week. Okay. Uh, unified. Unified or unified? Uh, unified. Unified. What if I go with the unified show? How do you like that? If that's what you want to say. <laughs> I have carte blanche when it comes to these credits. <laughs> okay. uh, unified is a joint production of UniWatch and SportsLogos.net. Our producer editor is Chris Fraterigo. Show notes for this episode are available at our website, unified.show. You can follow us on Twitter at, at UnifiedCast where you can also learn about the t-shirts and stickers we have for sale. Paul, you and I still don't have a t-shirt or sticker, but some of our fans have been sending in pictures of theirs. And uh, oh, well, there's a, there's a green t-shirt I saw the other day that someone got, which, yeah, yeah. which would have looked good for today's episode. I hope he's wearing it. <laughs> hope he's going to wear it. Uh, I hope he wore it yesterday for St. Patrick's Day. Uh, the unified logo is by Brian Gundell and our theme music this week, which was new for this episode, is by Chuck Rios. If you're listening to us on audio, you can also see where video versions of our episodes at youtube.com slash sports logos, where you can see that animation that precedes our videos, which is by Michael Princip. To submit a question to our question of the week segment or to inquire about advertising or anything else on your mind, please email us at info at unified.show. If you like our show, please leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or wherever podcasts are sold. That is it for today's episode. Stay well, and we will see you next week. Take care, Chris. This was really fun. Yeah, that was fun. Mm -hmm.